Hello, John. Hello. Hello. Who, who's, who's that? Very good, very good. Okay, espero. Yuri, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien, gracias. ¿Cómo te va? Les estoy arreglando ahora uh, a programa para poner en mi sitio de Neurosurgical, okay. de neurosurgical TV. Y bueno, he visto, he visto todos los progresos y todo el trabajo que estás haciendo. Es muy interesante. Sí, muy interesante. Sí, muy, muy tú, ok, si, si tú quieres... Ok, si tú quieres ayudar, bienvenidos. Gracias, gracias. Estaremos buscando una presentación y te me comunico contigo por interno, de repente por, por correo o por, o por otro, otro medio. Ok, sí, escríbeme, cualquier quieras. Vamos a discutir. Perfecto. Okay. Un gusto saludar. Porque, saludar. Porque, porque los españoles es más popular ahora. Uh, sí. Los charlas, sí, es mejorando. Yo he visto, yo he visto, yo he visto, mejorando, más, más. Sí, así es. Un gusto saludarte, yo. Voy a estar atento a la presentación. Me despido un minuto, me despido por unos minutos. Gracias. Sí, empezamos en 30 minutos. Perfecto, te veo, gracias. Oh, muchos estudiantes. Hello, Tatiana. Fuin Mayor. Y Christine. Y Cordo. Y... Hello, Kristen. Okay. Okay. Hi. How are you doing, Kristen? Hi, Hi Kristen. Oh, oh, lo siento, mi cámara no está. Okay. Bienvenidos. Gracias. Bienvenidos a todo. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Yeah, muchos estudiantes ahora. They throw the Ecuador, right? They don't hear us, Kristen. De Ecuador. Okay, bien, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Y, uh, okay, la otra persona es Dr. Ortiz Portilla. Aquí okay, es un neurosurgeon de Siria. Siria, imagínate, Siria. Es un país en guerra, guerra. Tú quieres encontrar a alguien de Siria? Uh, from Siria. Hola, hola, Omar. Uh, Omar. Okay. Estoy diciendo que tenemos un huésped de Siria. Okay. Y, Thank y you. Doctor Ortiz Portillo de Paraguay. Okay. Well, buenvenidos, uh, Ortiz. Sí, hablando español en Siria. Dr. Goel, is, he's here, uh, he's here, Omar. He, he will be discussing uh, and he'll be talking in English. Okay. Hello, or, or Dr. Ortiz, how are you doing? I know Dr. Ortiz was at the last 
webinar with Dr. Lanzino, right? That was good, right? Dr. Lanzino was good. He was very good. Very good. He's going to do that just once a month. But it I is Hawaii. and this morning we still uh, staying there. <coughs> uh, two more uh, raise them with Dr. Sandino. Oh, okay. Okay. See, Thank you uh, very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Va a estar más charlas en español. Hay más ahora. Hay más. Estamos todos ahora. La Sociedad Paraguaya de Ecuador. Yo soy miembro de la Sociedad Paraguaya de Neurocirugía y estamos todos en la Sociedad. Ah, sí, sí. Ha, ha, ha tenido neurocirujanos televisando en nuestro canal en neurocirugía. Sí, antes, está antes, conmigo. A, antes. Tú conoces, ¿verdad? Sí, lo conozco. Okay. Sí, Dr. Salazar es muy dedicada a esto. Okay, yo regreso, okay?
This is very odd. I'm trying to get people in, but some of them just can't get in. Uh, has anyone had trouble at other Zooms getting in? I can swear, because I, I just had a webcast and we had trouble getting people in for some reason. And it's new. It's a new problem. Not a lot of people, but a few people couldn't get in. Oh, no problem. Hi, Dennis, you get in. Okay. You there, Dennis? Now you're in. Okay, that's good. So you were, the, you were one of the guys, Dennis, I saw that I said, wait a minute, Dennis has been in before. Why is there a problem? There wasn't a big problem with you. You seen, but I couldn't get you. The first time you came through, I couldn't get you. For example, there's three people now I'm trying to click them in, but then they're just not coming in. Have you guys had a problem with other conferences like this where you can't get in? Boy, it's an active audience. I'm going to get a doctor to take your pulse. You may be declared legally dead. And you're not paying for that joke. Well, I guess if you were, you'd ask for a refund. We had no trouble getting in here in Ecuador, at least. Oh, hola, quien esta? Hi, I'm Jaime. Oh, Jaime, they don't hear us. Ecuador. Oh, qué bueno. Qué parte. Quito. Oh, Quito. Capital. Capital, yes. Mm -hmm. Bienvenidos. Thanks. Su primera vez, tú estás aquí hace una semana. I've been attending to uh, most of the conferences, but not as, an, uh, as a panelist, but as an attendee. So I haven't been able to interact Oh, okay, good, good. Uh, because were you having a hard time getting in? Uh, most of the uh, of the time, no. But um, a couple of conferences this week, I had uh, some trouble getting in. Uh, one of them, actually, the, the peripheral nerve conference, I couldn't get in because uh, it said the the room was full. Oh, okay. So I I wasn't allowed in. Oh, uh, okay. But you could see as an attendee, you can still hear, right? Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, sure. And you can see it, right? Yeah, yes. Okay. Because I wonder sometimes I should I leave people in the waiting room or just bounce them out? Because you can certainly watch it on Facebook and you can chat on Facebook and ask questions. But the audience does not know that really. They're just kind of learning the platform. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that, actually. Well, you know, once you guys learn this platform, we're going to have to go to another one because you know that this platform's going to have a lot of competition and they're going to all try to make better yes, ones. All good, good old America, they're going to try to make better stuff. I mean, it's a huge market now, huge. So all, I can see all kinds of platforms out there uh, I just need to find a good one, good one. Uh, but the, believe sure. me, this is going to get better. Uh, for example, there's one of the of the platforms I'm looking at that that you come through a waiting room to get in, and you can interact with the people in the waiting room with private chats. It's really cool, really, really cool. And, and we're, we're going to be using it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. We're, we're going to be using this on a trial. You're from Canada, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, you're going to see. Yeah, yeah. Are you from Canada? No, I'm from Ecuador. Oh, I thought you said for sure, for sure, because people from Canada say that a lot. Uh, no, uh, no, I'm from here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Ecuador. Okay, we start in 12 minutes. So I'll see you in a while. Okay, thanks. Yep. Well, Dennis, so it's working well in, in Germany. That's good. That's good. But you know what I think what it is, is lately Zoom, Zoom made some security changes and it's affecting people, people coming in because I, I haven't noticed this problem. It's not a big problem, just a couple of people. But our last chat from Mayo Clinic, uh, I bounced someone out, but they're from Mayo and they had, they had really good bandwidth and because I thought it was a bandwidth issue. You know, I thought maybe maybe that uh, Zoom in their latest iteration made something tighter, and now it's harder to get in <laughs> as a panel. Until they'll straighten it out, though. They, I mean, obviously, this is a big, huge investment, and they got the market now, so they got, they're not going to let it grow easy. Okay, we should have people coming in. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Goel's aide de camp, Abby, is here coming in. How are things in Germany, Dennis, with the COVID? Can you talk? Oh, no. You can text if you want. You don't want to. Like right now, there's four people trying to get in. I can't get them in. Keep clicking. I just assumed it was bad bandwidth until I contacted one of the guys I booted out because he wrote to me. He said, hey, why'd you boot me out? I said, you probably have a bad internet connection. And then he gave me the numbers of his, his, his download, upload, and ping. And they were all good. So I was wrong about people in the waiting room that can't get in. It's not a question of bandwidth. But I noticed, too, that people had been in before, <clears throat> like the Salazars, they usually get in. People have been here before. It seems. Okay, we've got 10 minutes.
How'd you guys hear of it? Did you you just see it on Facebook, LinkedIn, the mailing list? How'd you see it? Can anybody just volunteer? Just yell, hey, Facebook. Here's Abby. Hello, Dr. John. How are you? Okay. Oh, it's Victor. No, Abby's here. I don't know if you know Abby, uh, Omar. Abby, Abby, you there? Yes. Hi, John. Hi, Dr. George. Uh, yeah, that, Abby. That, Abby, how would you describe your, your title? An aide de camp? Like an aide de camp? Yeah. You, you know what that is, right? Aide de camp? Yeah, it's like a, a, a battlefield uh, a battlefield advisor or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, let me. Yeah, how'd you get over the Andes? Did you use? You didn't use elephants like Hannibal. <laughs> no, I flew over them. <laughs> oh, you flew over the Andes. Hey, I'll tell you a story about the Andes. I uh, I used to go to Colombia a lot and. When you fly over the Andes, and I think people will testify this in the panel, it is rough. Every time we came into Bogota, maybe you've been to cities like that, but we coming into Bogota, every time there was turbulence and shaking. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not making it up, Abby. I know you think I'm making it up for entertainment value. <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna you're not gonna fact check me are you no <laughs> okay did you see dr Hi, Andy? Did, they, you? hey Byron, hey byron how you doing how are you looking hey, are looking you? looking dapper today professor Shah. good morning good morning <laughs> how are you yes we have a great speaker today yes yes yeah well this is this is uh the aid the camp of uh, of Dr. Goel, is that she goes? She goes. She uh, I think you're working in the same hospital, right, Abby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she goes to a lot of the King's episodes, and Abby's given some really good neuroanatomy. That that's your area, right, Abby? That's your area of expertise that you like. No, that's something I like, along with the surgery, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let me try to pay attention to people getting in here. Oh, there, here's a tool now. Did he opt for a plane? Did he come in by a plane also? Well, I guess we'll find out. We'll find out. He got a chartered flight. Hey, Dr. Goel, how you doing? My dear friend, what is happening? Hey, yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're in my area of the world now. <laughs> Ecuador today, huh? Yes. Professor Goyle, well, nice to meet you. Hi, Van George. How are Thank you? Thank you so much for coming with us today. Hi, Dr. Yes. Atol. How are you? Hello, Professor How are you? Oh, Thank you. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. My Professor Avisha. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, John. How are How you? you? Good. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming to our webinar. Okay. Okay, welcome to everybody. We start in four minutes. Perfect. Thank you. So, Atul, you've been busy as usual. Yeah. Uh, at, uh, at, uh, so what, is, uh, what is the language in Ecuador? What is the official language? Spanish. 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 Oh, yeah. Spanish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Byron, you want me to speak in Spanish or what? Oh, we were thinking... You were going, going to, to, to give your lecture in English, so, so. <laughs> if you want to talk in Spanish, <laughs> we have no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, uh, let's see, Dr. Flores, Omar. Hello, Juan Luis, how are you doing? Welcome. Fine, thank you, sir. Good morning. Hey, welcome. Welcome, Professor Gomez Amador. Luis. Hello, Professor. How are you? Welcome, Professor Mauro Loyo. 
Okay, two minutes. So Byron, you're going to run it, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're going to mo you moderate it. You moderate it and everything. You know, we had we just had a webcast with Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Lanzino. And it's so much better when you have a moderator that's a neurosurgeon or a resident or someone that's in the field because they can moderate the flow. Do you know what I mean? If you have someone like me that's not a neurosurgeon, when people ask questions, I really don't know the context of the question. And some of the questions are related where a surgeon would know that. We'd say, oh, wait, we asked that question a while ago. You know what I mean? So I, mm -hmm. I prefer to have you, you, you know, moderate and, and, and carry the flow. Okay, we have, uh, we have Ecuador, we have Germany, we have Syria. Uh, where else in the world are we represented? Uh, there's a couple. Kristen, you, you're from Ecuador, Kristen, right? I think most people. Are. Hello, Juan, are you from Ecuador also? Juan Correa? No, I am from Panama. Oh, Hello. welcome. 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 Dr. Correa. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? And, and we, all, we all we have okay. all right we have someone from uh, paraguay also uh, yeah yeah the, uh, we call dr goel the king of zoom uh, be, because he gives the most zoom of anybody uh, he goes from continent to continent <laughs> and this is the first time in Latin America, right? Is, uh, at all. Is this your first time? No, no. I've oh, been in Brazil many... in, oh, okay. in, uh, several times okay. and in some other countries. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. We're going to have our Latin American Congress on November. So it will be a pleasure for us if you could actually come here. You know, we know all the COVID regulations, but uh, we are pleased to announce that it's going to be um, physical, a presidential mode. Okay. So if you have time, if you could come, you know, we can make some arrangements Thank for you, you to come Thank here, you. Thank to you, get buddy. to know Thank Ecuador. <laughs> of course, of course. Very I would good. certainly like to come. Okay, Byron, we're going to start. Okay, 10, 9, yeah, 8, sure. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good, at, good afternoon, Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. Lo siento, estoy hablando en inglés. Bienvenidos, este, este canal, esta charla de uh, Atul Goel. Se llama El Rey de Zoom, porque él, él hace mucho programas en todo el mundo, incluyendo Latinoamérica, yo descub, acabo de descubrir. Entonces, déjame introducir al host. Byron Salazar. Bienvenidos, Byron. Bienvenidos a todos. Eh, quería agradecerles y indicarles que la charla del día de hoy será en inglés, por lo tanto, permítanme hacer las introducciones pertinentes en el mismo. Good morning to you all. My name is Byron Salazar, and as the president of the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery, it is my pleasure to welcome all the participants today for this fourth session of our continuing medical education course in neurosurgery held by the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery and its academic committee. I welcome all the eminent speakers and guests from all over the world that are here with us in this beautiful event. And we appreciate you taking this time to share your knowledge and vast experience with all of us. These seminars are completely conducted on a digital platform on Neurosurgical TV and has brought us together in this time of social distancing to COVID-19 pandemic. So, I would like to congratulate Dr. John Bennett for this monumental effort. And we are proud to announce that these webinar courses are being conducted along with the cooperation of the International University of Ecuador, which assists with the academic support of these events. And we have a truly special guest today, and I already know his lecture and the following discussion will help students, residents, and young neurosurgeons to expand their mental horizon and will help them and all participants to become better surgeons. 
I would like to thank for the presence of master surgeons like uh, Juan Luis Gomez Amado, Professor Shan, so many others that are here with us. And now I would like to present to you uh, Professor Jorge Salazar from Ecuador, head of the Department, Department of Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery from the Metropolitan Hospital, which is going to introduce, introduce the, uh, today's, today's extraordinary, extraordinary speaker. speaker. Hello. Good morning. Good evening to everyone. On uh, behalf of the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery, I'm sorry, it's my fault. I muted the wrong person. Sorry. Just unmute yourself there. I... Yeah, unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I'm sorry. That was my fault. Yes. Okay. And I would like to give all of you the, the best welcome to our panelist attendings and, of course, our renowned and one of the most experienced neurosurgeons in the world, Professor Atul Goel, who will present his lecture on surgery on lesions involved cavernous sinus. Professor Atul Goel is head and professor of the Department of Neurosurgery at King Edward. Memorial Hospital and Sets GS Medical College, Parallel, Mumbai, India. He is Chief Editor, International Journal of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine, and Advisory Board Member of other renowned journals. He is Honorary Member of Japan, Venezuelan, Bangladesh, and Egyptian Neurosurgical Societies. He is the past president of the Asian Oceanian School-Based Surgery Society, author of many books, book chapters, and publications. Professor Atul Goel presents a great experience on cavernous sinus surgery, and he started as a school-based neurosurgeon in 1986. In 1996, Professor Goel published his book, Neurosurgery on Complex Tumors and Vascular Lesions with extensive chapters on cavernous sinus surgery. Among his multiple publications and research projects, there are several articles about the role of cavernous sinus and eye movements, the importance of meninges in tumor surgery approach, meningeal architecture of cavernous sinus, in 1997, he published about the estradural approach to lesions of cavernous sinus, several articles in relation to treatment of chordomas, meningiomas, trigeminal neurinomas, cavernous angiomas, tuberculomas, and diverse surgical techniques and approaches to cavernous sinus lesions. I really appreciate Dr. Atul Goel for his valuable time and disposition to collaborate with our educational program in neurosurgery. Welcome, Professor Atul. Well, the session is all yours. Thank you, George. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, John. And it is my great pleasure and very big honor to be present for the Ecuadorian Society of Neurosurgery. And uh, I see the mountain behind you, George. Wonderful, is it in Ecuador or some other country? Yeah, this is the Cotopaxi volcano in Ecuador, one of the highest mountains and active volcano. Okay, so I hope I can come and see this beautiful volcano sometime in my life. And Byron has already invited me to the Latin American Society of Neurosurgery, so I hope I can come. So let me just begin my lecture, and I'm going to talk... Uh, can you see my slide now, George? Yes. Yes, yes, I can see. So basically I will give my philosophy, my strategy and my technique of how to operate on the lesions involving cavernous sinus. Basically it is a philosophical kind of presentation. Cavernous sinus. You know, there is no question that those who want to do cavernous sinus surgery have to learn anatomy. 
and have to learn anatomy in a very, very fantastic manner. There is no shortcut to doing cavernous sinus surgery. And these are my books. Which, this is the one I wrote in 1996. Sorry for that. Just a minute. So this is the book I wrote in 1996, lesions involving complex tumors and vascular lesion. And if you see the cover page, you see the wonderful dissection that was done in 1996. The whole Peter's bone has been removed. Facial nerve has been mobilized. Carotid artery has been mobilized. Gasserian ganglion has been mobilized. And this is my exposure skull base exposure in 1996. And I will talk to you next lecture on craniovertebral junction and spine. So keep this title for the next lecture. So cavernous sinus is a wonderful structure. Nobody has ever talked about the role of cavernous sinus in eye movements, in vision, and there are several articles of mine mentioning as the role of cavernous sinus. It is not just a venous plexus. It has got several functions in eye movements. The cavernous sinus of a lion is much smaller than the cavernous sinus of a deer because the deer's eyes move front and back very fast, very rapidly it moves because it has to jump and it has to also see how far is the line. So the eye movements are very rapid, front and back, front and back. The lion's eyes do not move much. It has to only look towards the tail of this deer, which is running and catch hold. So because the eye movements are very rapid and very quick, the eye, the cavernous sinus is much bigger in a deer than in a lion. The eyes, only 30 degrees in a lion. In human being, it is 70 degrees. In a deer, it is 180 degrees eye movements. So bigger the eye movements, bigger the cavernous sinus. And it has also several functions which are discussed in my papers. And I wish that you please read my articles. Cavernous sinus is very intently related to the eye. There is venous plexus behind the eyeball. Eyeball is a hydrodynamic fun. It, has, it is high degree of hydrodynamics. The lens, the aqueous humor, the vitreous humor, the, the, the turgidity of the eyeball is very important for the retina to function. And this turgidity of the eyeball is maintained by the venous plexus and the quick drain off that the venous plexus present to the cavernous sinus. So my philosophy is that cavernous sinus is very intimately related to the eyeball and to the function of the eyeball and to the retina. You see, this is the circle of Willis. Similarly, there is a circle of relief. I like to call it circle of relief of cavernous sinus. There are intercavernous sinus connections and there are huge venous plexuses. These are the largest venous connection in the whole of the skull. So cavernous sinus and intercavernous sinuses are very important for the function. If you press the eyeball like this, the pressure will go instantly to the opposite cavernous sinus. And there will be diplopia for some time and then the pressures will be regulated. So there is a kind of a balance which the cavernous sinus provides and also protects the eyeball. So when there is cavernous sinus thrombosis, the eye movements are lost, not because the nerves are gone, but because the venous function of the cavernous sinus is lost, the venous drainage is lost. So cavernous sinus has a big role in eye movements and vision. 
So it has a role in vision, cavernous, this hand is like cavernous sinus and cavernous sinus protects, supports the eyeball and its various contents. So there are several other functions of eyeball, which we have discussed in our articles on this subject. And uh, unfortunately my point, this is not running. So the eyes, what the eyes of various animals, of course are important, but what lies behind the eyeball is also important. And what lies eye behind is of course the brain, but also the beauty of cavernous sinus. So cavernous sinus is very closely related to the sphenoid sinus. Cavernous sinus is very closely related to the pituitary gland. Cavernous sinus is intimately related to the carotid artery. Pituitary gland is not only located extracranial, but it is located in a, whether it is intracranial or extracranial, nobody knows. It has a special cavity and special relationship with cavernous sinus. So these relationships are very important for the function of the pituitary gland, for the function of the cavernous sinus, and for the function of the sphenoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus and paranasal sinuses and oral mucosa are the most vascular structures of the body. When the air goes inside the nose, the temperature outside may be hot or cold, but as soon as it reaches the nose, because of the turbinates and because of the movements of the air, the and presence of vascular mucosa, it becomes normal temperature. When you drink hot water or cold water, as soon as it goes in the esophagus, it is normal temperature because of the vascular oral mucosa. So this is paranasal sinuses are like air conditioners of the body. They give information of the external temperature to the cavernous sinus. And then the cavernous sinus gives that information to the pituitary gland. And then this master pituitary, pituitary gland regulates the whole body. The temperature of inside the body is given to the cavernous sinus by the carotid artery. So there is, you know, the structure and function are interrelated. More the function, structural innovations by nature are due to functional needs of the body. The other beautiful thing that you see in the cavernous sinus is the relationship of the carotid artery, relationship of the sixth nerve. This is the third nerve, this is the fourth nerve, this is V1 division of the trigeminal nerve, this is V2 division of the trigeminal nerve, V3 division goes before the cavernous sinus. So these nerves, all these nerves are located in the lateral dural wall, dural wall of the cavernous sinus. They are not intracavernous, they are interdural these nerves located within the confines of the dura of the lateral wall of cavernous sinus. So I will discuss this anatomy with you very soon. So this is from Arabic legacy. It means that the meninges are the mother of brain. So meninges are born first, brain is born next and the last to be born is the bones. So bones are the weakest part of the human body and meninges are very strong. So ectoderm, neuroectoderm. So these are born very early in the evolution. Brain is born later and bones are the weakest born the last. Now I will discuss with you about the dura and the magic of dura. You see the dura contains the brain. It is impermeable membrane. No infection, no external influence can influence the brain. So it, it is a very highly compact, protected environment 
that the dura provides. And the brain has a special immunity to various infection and to abscessing. So the dura is a very compact membrane and dura is important to understand. And I will talk to you about the dura and its implications for cavernous sinus surgery. So I am involved in cavernous sinus surgery for a very long time. And in 1998, I wrote this article about impact of arterial displacement on strategies of cavernous sinus surgeries and cavernous sinus surgery. So these are very important articles for me. And this had great influence during that time, 25 years ago, about surgery of cavernous sinus. At that time, <clears throat> surgery of cavernous sinus was not so popular 25, 30 years ago. So this was my article. It shows that carotid artery can be encased by the tumor. Carotid artery is displaced by the tumor. So these tumors are different. So these pictures are from my book, from my uh, article in 1998. Like you can identify the pathological nature of the tumors by the relationship with carotid artery. When it is compressed, it is different. When it is displaced, it is different. When it is encased, it is different. So this was my article. So my, I work in a public hospital, in a public free charitable institute, which caters to the, in general, to poor population of our country. And the most important thing is our patient volume is without any doubt the largest volumes in the world. So I have been involved with this hospital and with this very complex skull-based cases for a very long time. You see this kind of tumor I operated in 1993. You can imagine carotid artery encasement, basilar encasement, PCOM encasement. And I had removed this tumor in 1993, this meningioma. And this lady is still alive. Patient had presented with blindness of both eyes at that time. She's still blind, but she, still she's alive more than 27, 28 years ago. I did this operation in 1995. You see how the tumor is going in the orbit, in the cavernous sinus, encasing the carotid. So essentially, we need very big experience to do these kind of cases. This was anterior clinoid and meningioma. I had left some tumor behind. No radiation was given even at that time. And this patient is also alive. This patient did not do any follow-up imaging, but this patient is also alive. How to attack the tumor, how to understand the tumor, how to debulk the tumor, how to demolish the tumor how to avoid coagulation, how to dissect in the subarachnoid spaces, and most importantly, how to respect the membranes is very critical for a neurosurgeon. This was another tumor I operated. You can imagine 24 years ago, cavernous sinus involvement, basilar involvement, petrous apex involvement. So that is my power, that number of cases I have been doing for a very long time and my hospital is giving me this opportunity to do several of these cases. So this is a tumor behind the orbit and in the cavernous sinus. Both tumors are benign tumors and both tumors and this patient in 1997, first I removed the orbital tumor and then we removed the cavernous sinus tumor and both these tumors are removed completely. And this boy you see is completely intact vision in one eye is absent, but nobody can know that he is not able to see from one eye. Only I know that he does not have vision in one eye. But you see eye movements are normal. And he's also alive for several years without any major issue. My main contribution to this subject is understanding of the dura. And in 1997, I described extradural approach for tumors inside the cavernous sinus. Of course, we know of the work of Vinko Dolenz. He described extradural approach to aneurysms of this area. He also described trigeminal neuridoma, but 
this was the first article which described intracavernous sinus lesions extradural approach. Cavernous sinus is an extradural entity. So extradural approach is possible and is the most wonderful approach for cavernous sinus tumors. I will now talk to you about the tumors involving cavernous sinus and the relationship with the dura. So this tumor is the most difficult tumor in neurosurgery. This is intracavernous hemangioma or cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus. This was the first report in the literature showing complete resection of these tumors, this tumor. This is the most vascular tumor of neurosurgery and most benign tumor. It is a primary intracavernous sinus tumor. It is located within the confines of the cavernous sinus. The dura of the cavernous sinus is completely intact. It goes towards the intercavernous sinus dura, goes towards the orbit, goes towards the Meckel cave, it encases the internal carotid artery. It is an extremely vascular tumor. You touch and it bleeds. But I described this kind, this tumor is extra dural approach for these tumors. This is an extra dural entity and extra dural approach is the most beautiful tumor. So even when the tumor becomes huge like this, it goes towards the intercavernous sinus, goes towards the Meckel's cave, goes towards the orbit. Lateral wall of the dura remains intact. So this is a very important anatomical landmark or understanding that the dura is intact. And accordingly, you have to decide how to operate on these tumors. So we described this extradural approach for intracavernous hemangioma for the first time in the literature on the basis of my experience with 13 cases in the year 2003. Now my experience with these cases is 47 or 48 cases, which is the largest in the world. Extradural, respect the dura, cavernous sinus is an extradural entity and you can approach this tumor extradurally. Many of these cases come with headache and many of these patients come with eye movement disturbance. And the only treatment for this is resection of this tumor. And I will briefly show you one video. Of course, this surgery has to be done in a vascular situation. Bleeding. So what one a skull-based surgeon or cavernous sinus has to do is don't worry about bleeding. You see this, I'm doing extradural exposure. This is V2, this is V1. And I am trying, you see your blood. So most important thing is try to avoid getting too much worried about blood. So I'm extradural. So this is V2 division, V1 division. And here will be foramen ovale. I'm trying to expose this tumor from the Parkinson triangle. You see, this is right side. This is, this is the right-sided surgery. Too much bleeding. This is a very old case, of course. Then first thing that you have to go is, and you will be surprised that this is, a, this is not an edited version. I am editing on my screen. The first thing that you have to expose is the sixth nerve. And this is intracavernous carotid artery. And then this, the tumor has been resected. So extra, in short, extradural exposure is a beautiful exposure. And this is the third nerve involved, sixth nerve involved. And within two months of surgery, you get the nerves back and you get the smile back. And there is no other treatment like radiation and all may not work recently. Some people are talking about radiation, but radiation does not work here you have to do operation and you have to operate in a bloody field. Now, another tumor I will show you intracavernous cavernous hemangioma. Just see, I'll rapidly show you this extradural approach. This is transgasserian ganglion approach. I am working through the cavernous, uh, through the gasserian ganglion and uh, I'm opening the gasserian ganglion then working within 
the fibers of the trigeminal nerve. And then I'm removing this tumor, which is a vascular tumor, very heavily vascular tumor. You have to first identify and save the sixth nerve, then identify the carotid artery and save. And then you have to coagulate the lateral trunk of the cavernous sinus, which, is, which supplies these vascular tumors. And then you have to um, remove these tumors in a very efficient manner. You see here, I'm trying to coagulate the meningeal, this branch of the cavernous sinus, and then I'm removing the tumor from the cavernous sinus. And as I have mentioned to you, these are very, very vascular tumors. And if you are afraid of blood, then you should not be doing these tumors. If you, are, if you want to accept the challenge of bleeding, if you want to accept the blood, blood loss, and you are geared up with your anesthetist and with your team and with your assistant, then you can certainly give new life to this patient because these are benign tumors. These are vascular tumors, all right, but these are completely benign. And you can have, you see intracavernous, this is the carotid artery here. And no question that surgery is difficult. I have already told you that these tumors are amongst the most difficult neurosurgical tumors. So this is pre-op and post-op. Most important is that they remain within the dura. You have to identify the sixth nerve and save the sixth nerve early. Third, fourth, and fifth nerves remain in the lateral wall of the dura. So you don't have to bother about this as long as you're working within the dura and you can remove these tumors beautifully. This was another case where there is a cavernous hemangioma or cavernous sinus. You see the lateral dural wall is intact, encasement of internal carotid artery going towards the intercavernous sinus, Meckel's cave orbit. There is an aneurysm here. So I removed this tumor extradurally and clipped the aneurysm. These are difficult neurosurgical problems. This is another case, large tumor and has been removed as I mentioned. My experience is now about 46 or 47 cases, which is the largest. These are rare tumors. Now I want to show you common tumors, pituitary tumors, and how the relationship of pituitary tumors can influence your surgery and what my contribution in this field is. So I have got several articles on pituitary tumors and what the relationship of pituitary tumors with dura. And there are, you see, I'm giving you the, these references and you can have a look on these papers. So many a times pituitary tumors become very large and huge, but they are benign. You see, there are cyst, cystic changes, necrotic changes. They can become very huge and massive in size, but radical surgery can give an opportunity to give a new life. So first thing that we described about 25 years ago for the first time in the literature is when these tumors become big, the dura of the diaphragm cellae is elevated on the dome of the tumor. The understanding before that, and before we described, the understanding was this tumor pierces the diaphragm cellae and this tumor in the supracellar region is subarachnoid in location. So we described that the diaphragm cellae is elevated on the dome of the tumor for the first time in the literature. You see the diaphragm is elevated like this. The tumor is subdiaphragmatic. It is supracellar, but subdiaphragmatic. The entire tumor is surrounded by dura. So this is intradural tumor. And this is very important to understand. You see when there is a small, Dubbin of tumor like this, this is also dura. So it is completely surrounded by dura. And this is if you have to do large pituitary tumors, you have to have this information because if you don't have this information, you cannot do this tumor. You see this nubbin of tumor here, this is also dura, dura, this whole thing is dura. So the whole tumor is interdural in location. This is intracranial, but sub, it is not subarachnoid. It is 
subdural or intradural in location. This tumor, which is going in the brainstem like this, is, is of course having that relationship, but a dura protects it. Dura protects and there is dural cover. So this is very important thing that we describe about 25 years ago. Tumors which go in the cavernous sinus. You see, there are some tumors which enter into cavernous sinus. So the lateral dural wall is intact of the cavernous sinus. This is dura of the diaphragm. Lateral dural wall of the cavernous sinus is intact. Tumors which involve the cavernous sinus, we graded them as grade two pituitary tumors. You see tumor is involving the cavernous sinus, the diaphragm is involved, the diaphragm is not pierced, the diaphragm is elevated. The lateral wall is intact. Cavernous sinus, the medial, so cavernous sinus is an extradural entity, so this is completely within the dura. These are grade two tumors. So when the tumor involves the cavernous sinus, the lateral wall is intact, diaphragm is intact, we label it as grade two. Sometimes the diaphragm is very much stretched, tight like this. The lateral wall is tight like this, but not transgressed. These are grade two tumors. Now you carefully look at this slide. You see the cavernous sinus is involved by the tumor when the carotid artery is encased circumferentially. The diaphragm is intact. Now you see this slide, the diaphragm is elevated and there is elevation of the roof, dural roof of the cavernous sinus. Dura of the cavernous sinus is elevated and this is the lateral wall of cavernous sinus. Here the lateral wall this is the diaphragm, this is elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus. This tumor is elevating the roof of the cavernous sinus. So this is very important to understand that this tumor is intracranial all right, but it is completely surrounded by dura. Now you see this beautiful slide, there is diaphragm cellae and there is elevation of the dura of the roof of cavernous sinus and there is lateral wall of cavernous sinus. So though the whole tumor is completely within the dural limitations. You see this beautiful slide, there is elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus, elevation of diaphragm, elevation of roof of cavernous sinus. When the roof of cavernous sinus is elevated, I call it grade three p 2 t tumor. Grade four tumors are rare when the, it goes, it transgresses the dura. When it goes in the subarachnoid spaces, when it encases the arteries of the circle of villus, these tumors which do not respect the mother dura, dura mother, I call them grade four or aggressive pituitary tumors. So this is my classification. Grade one is when the diaphragm is elevated, but the cavernous sinus is not involved. Grade two is when the cavernous sinus is invaded by the tumor. Grade three is when the dural roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated. Grade four is when the arteries of the circle of villus are encased by the tumor. So my feeling is this dura, this dural relationship has completely revolutionized P2T tumor surgery. It is not that you use endoscope or microscope or whatever. It is important to understand that the dura will bulge, dura will be present and you can accordingly design your surgery. So this is the tumor and this is the dura. So just open the anterior wall of the cella, debulk the tumor, debulk the tumor, learn the art of demolishing the tumor, learn the art of protecting the dura, and you will be able to remove this tumor in 20 minutes. And you see the whole tumor will be removed and the patient will instantly improve in the vision. This case was done in 1997 on the basis of dura. So like the fetus which will be delivered by the uterus 
and uterus is the strongest muscle of the human body. It will push the baby out. Similarly, the dura will be pushing the baby of P2T tumor down. So you don't have to do transcranial surgery for this. <clears throat> and I have to tell you 25 years ago, 30 years ago, all neurosurgeons used to do these kind of cases transcranial. So understanding that this dura, you demolish the tumor, demolish the tumor, the diaphragm cell will bulge into your field and the tumor is benign and the patient will be completely cured. So these tumors, if you know, if you know that the diaphragm is intact, you can do this surgery very beautifully and safely. If you do not know that the diaphragm is intact, you cannot operate on these tumors. Subfrontal extension was a classical indication for transcranial root, but no question, you come, you remove this from here, you debulk the tumor, debulk the tumor, the whole diaphragm will be in your picture and you have removed the tumor. So even when the tumor goes like that, you don't have to look in this respect or in this direction, you have to just remove, know the art of P2T tumor surgery, whether you use microscope or whether you use endoscope or whether you use what is not a matter of concern. What you have to know is that the dura will come out into the field and you will have removed this tumor. You can imagine 20 years ago, I removed this tumor through the nose by microscope, just by removing this wall understanding the fact that the dura of the diaphragm is intact, you remove the tumor and you remove the whole tumor and nothing but the tumor and you cure the person. This was another tumor I removed 22 years ago through the nose. This was immediate post-operative. You can imagine, I just removed this anterior wall, debulk the tumor, debulk the tumor. And over the years of last 35 years, I have been doing P2T tumor my experience is more than 5,000 cases, which is the largest experience in the, in the field, amongst the largest at least. Cavernous sinus, how to do and what to do is important. But what is important is to know that the dura is intact, sixth nerve is displaced by the tumor. This tumor is removed by virtue of its consistency and by the virtue of its vascularity, and you can work within the cavernous sinus in a very efficient manner. The question remains in grade three tumors, when the roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated, you have removed this tumor, but the, if you have not removed this tumor, then these, the chances of recurrence of these tumors is very high and then you will have to give radiation treatment. If you know that the dural roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated, you can enter into this cavernous sinus and remove this tumor under the dura. The sixth nerve is very, the third nerve is, it is very crucial to understand that the third nerve will be displaced, which is also within the dural confines. And you can avoid, if you respect the dura, you can save the third nerve in a very efficient manner. Tumors which transgress the dura and involve the arteries are different and we have to learn how to operate on these tumors. Now I will talk on another, my favorite tumor, trigeminal neuronoma. This was the article I wrote in 2003 on my 73 cases. Now we have an experience of more than 300 cases of trigeminal neuronoma. This was my very beautiful article. Here we mentioned for the first time in the literature that trigeminal neuronomas are located within the dura, interdural location. And this interdural location can be used for surgery. The trigeminal nerve does, the neuronoma does not enter into the confines of the cavernous sinus, does not encase the carotid artery, does not encase the third nerve. It is interdural in location. We mentioned for the first time in the literature that these tumors arise within the Meckel scale, like acoustic tumor arise from the internal artery canal. These tumors arise within the Meckel scale and from there it 
becomes big. So these tumors can go into the posterior cranial fossa. In this article, I had said that posterior cranial fossa part of the tumor is subarachnoid in location. But as we have more and more experience, we have mentioned that even this posterior fossa component of the tumor is subdural or interdural in location. And this anatomical understanding is absolutely important if you want to do trigeminal neurinoma surgery. So in 1995, about 26 years ago, we described infratemporal fossa interdural approach to trigeminal neurinoma. You can imagine in 1995, trigeminal neurinomas were very difficult to diagnose and difficult to operate. So we did trigeminal neurinomas without craniotomy on the basis of understanding that these tumors are trigeminal neurinoma, that is one, and these tumors are interdural in location. You can see my title in 1995, and from this article, I will show you some images. So this was removed, this tumor was diagnosed on the basis of clinical presenting symptoms of numbness and paresthesia and wasting of temporalis and masseter muscle as trigeminal neurinoma. I removed it without doing any craniotomy by interdural surgical route. And also in 1994, you can imagine how difficult these tumors must be in 1994, going into the petroclival area, going into the cavernous sinus. So this was diagnosed to be trigeminal schwannoma. And I did this in 1994 without craniotomy by just opening and widening the Meckel's cave. And you can see this post-operative image. And this was published in that article. This was another case which I did without craniotomy by just widening of the foramen ovale and then opening the dura. I do not do such cases like this anymore. I will show you what my strategy is. But what is important for us to understand is that trigeminal neurinomas are located within the dura. The other thing that I described for the first time in the literature in my article in 2003 is that you can save the fibers of the fifth nerve and you can improve the function of the fifth nerve as a series it was described for the first time. And I have no hesitation to say that if you are damaging the fifth nerve in trigeminal neurinoma surgery, you have harmed the interest of the patient. So work within the dura, work within the dura, learn the art of demolishing the tumor, learn the art of working within bloody field and avoid coagulation. Many of these tumors or most of these tumors can be removed without a single coagulation. And we have to learn that art of demolishing the tumor. Many of these tumors go in the posterior fossa 30 years ago or 35 years ago. All these tumors were not understood. That was one. And if they were understood, they were done in two stages. So in 1991, I did this operation in two stages. The larger tumor in the cavernous sinus was removed as first stage, and then the posterior fossa was removed as the second stage. So these tumors were removed in two stages. So this tumor was the posterior fossa was removed first, and cavernous sinus was removed second. This was the history of these, but of course, by some several people described and skull-based surgery advanced, and these, patients, these tumors are definitely and always removed in a single stage now. So we, from 1996, we had described this lateral skull base approach and we incorporated mastoidectomy in subtemporal exposure, removal of the roof of zygoma, roof of condyle, roof of external canal, partial mastoidectomy. So we included mastoidectomy for the first time in the literature in subtemporal exposure. And we used to do such exposure extradural and then cut the dura and enter the tumor and then intradural for dumbbell shaped tumors. But now my exposures have become very limited for trigeminal neurinoma. I not, this was a very large exposure. I now just do splitting of the temporalis muscle, do a smallish craniotomy and then work extradural and then interdural for these kind of tumors. 
So most important is my hospital has given me this opportunity of very heavy experience with these tumors, which of course is the largest in the world of 300 cases, work within the dura cum. For these dumbbell shaped tumor, I do intradural exposure. You have to take, you have to handle the superior petrosal sinus, you have to cut the tentodium, you have to work within the dura, work within the dura. As I mentioned, many of these posterior fossa tumors are also interdural in location, but even if it is not interdural, you have to demolish, learn the art of demolishing the tumor, and you can remove this beautiful tumor, beautiful dumbbells, and uh, this will instantly give the patient a very fantastic life if and only if you have saved the fifth nerve fibers. If you have damaged the V1 division, you have damaged the eye and you have damaged the patient. You cannot, you have to demolish the tumor, debulk the tumor, learn the art of debulking the tumor, breaking the tumor, breaking the tumor, avoid any coagulation, learn to respect the dura, don't go into cavernous sinus or you will damage the sixth nerve, you can damage the carotid artery and don't demolish the dura on the lateral side because there are third nerve, there is fourth nerve, there are other nerves in this territory. So work within the dura, identify a good direction and demolish the tumor and you can remove these tumors most beautifully and most fantastically, even when there is a nubbin like this, this is not intracavernous, there is dura present, dura present all around the tumor. Break the tumor, break the tumor. And as I mentioned, you can remove without craniotomy, but it becomes little cumbersome. Do a small subtemporal craniotomy, come extradural, open the dura, demolish the tumor, and you will not believe that many of these tumors I do in half an hour or 20 minutes. And that is the whole operation will not be even 45 minutes. So these tumors are the, you have to understand these tumors. You have to learn the art of breaking the tumor. You see the pitrosectomy is already done by the tumor. Anticlinoidectomy has already been done by the tumor. You do not have to do any bone work. You have to do only tumor resection, and you have to respect only dura. If you respect mother dura, you have given a new life to the patient. When the tumor goes extra cranial, there is also dura present. This is along the V1, along the V2, by the side of teeth, along the V3. We described 28 cases in 2010. Now I have got several cases. This is also the largest series. Most important is, that this extra cranial part is also interdural. So we do not do this by the nose or by maxillary root. We do a, make a small craniotomy and then go along. So it is a reverse skull based transcranial root. Open the dura, respect the dura, respect the dura, and you can do a beautiful tumor resection. Even when the tumor recurs, in an apoplectic fashion, in these massive tumors, I have you read this article where I have said the tumor recurrence, even in those cases, the tumor respects the dura. Now I will show you another tumor, which is a difficult skull-based tumor, and I will show you how it respects the dura. This is a third nerve neuronoma. If you want to remove third nerve neuronoma and save the third nerve, you have to know that the dura is completely around the tumor. You tu the dura is not the tumor. This is soft tumor, necrotic tumor, break the tumor, and you can save the third nerve function. So we describe this interdural root. The tumor like trigeminal neuronoma arises from the metal scape. Oculomotor neuronoma arises from the oculomotor cistern in this area. And as it becomes large, it takes the dura along with it. So it is an interdural. <clears throat> this tumor remains interdural. So the capsule, it is not a capsule, it is dura. So you debulk the tumor, break the tumor, break the tumor, but don't try to remove the capsule and you can save the third nerve function in a very beautiful manner. If you think it is not duritis capsule, you will never be able to save the third nerve. You see the dura is completely circumferentially around the third nerve neuronoma. 
and you have to save the dura if you have to save the third nerve function. This is a sixth nerve neuronoma. The only schwannoma which will encase the carotid artery is a sixth nerve schwannoma. And then you, I am working on the strategy of how to work within the dura in this situation. I want to show you another skull-based tumor. This is seventh nerve neuronoma. Now, as I mentioned to you, acoustic tumor arises from the, uh, from the internal artery canal trigeminal from the macular scape, third nerve from the oculomotor cistern, seven nerve arises from the internal artery meatus, from the region of the geniculate ganglia. Seven nerve is interdural, completely within the dura. And if you respect, if you understand that this is going to be seven nerve tumor, that is one, it is going to be a benign tumor, that is number two, and if you understand that the dura is completely circumferentially surrounding the tumor, you can save the seven nerve function. So this approach, this tumor can be removed in not more than half an hour. You see there is necrotic tumor, soft tumor, open the dura, debulk the tumor, save the transit of the seven nerve. I have never been able to restore the seven nerve function. I have never been, but there is a possibility. So you can actually identify the seven nerve and make an anastomosis if you have to, but if you preserve the dura, you can preserve the seven nerve function. Lower cranial nerve neuronoma. So like seven nerve tumor arises from the geniculate ganglion. Lower cranial nerve neuronoma arise from the jugular bulb area and they are also interdural, they respect the dura. This is also one of my most fascinating papers. If you work within the dura, work within the tumor, dura without transiting the dura, you can not only save the function of the lower cranial nerve, you can improve the function of lower cranial nerve. So if you read this article, you will see that all my 14 patients, which I described when I described, had improved lower cranial nerve function after surgery. So these tumors arise in the region of the jugular bulb. The dura circumferentially surrounds the tumor. The entire tumor, extracranial and intracranial, is surrounded by dura, and you have to work within the dura to remove this tumor and avoid the lower cranial nerve. You see, when this tumor goes extracranial, you work within, you leave the dura and you will save the lower cranial nerve function. Not only save the lower cranial nerve function, you can improve the lower cranial nerve function. So that is a very important dural relationship of the various tumors. I will now talk about second nerve neuronoma. This is C2. This is C1, this is C2, this is the vertebral artery, this is C2 ganglion, which is a very large ganglion. C2 ganglion is the largest ganglion of the spine. Gasserian ganglion is the largest ganglion of the skull. So this is trigeminal neuronoma surrounded by cavernous sinus, surrounded by carotid artery. C2 ganglion surrounded by venous plexus and in relationship with the vertebral, with the vertebral artery. So they are very similar. Similar, like I mentioned, that gasserian ganglion tumors are interdural in location. Similarly, C2 neuronomas are interdural in location. So we described some time ago that C2 neuronomas are like trigeminal neuronomas. This part is interdural and this part is intradural. Like we described, this part is interdural, this part is subdural. But later we said, that this part is also interdural. So similarly, we said in my paper in 2008 that this part is intradural, but in 2018, I said that even this part is interdural. So here we had described 60 cases of C2 neuronomas. And in this article, I described 50 cases of C2 neuronomas. The change in policy was the whole tumor is interdural. You make an incision in the dura and you can remove this tumor. I have shown in some workshops, at least two workshops, removal of these kind of tumors in 10 minutes and the whole operation being finished in 20 minutes. So I'm telling you not that time is not the matter. Time is not the concern. 
the issue is if you respect the dura, you don't have to expose the vertebral artery. You don't have to have control of the vertebral artery. You don't have to, you just respect the dura and you can do a beautiful respect, beautiful tumor resection. You have to learn the art of demolishing the tumor. So this is C2 neuronoma. It is going intraspinal, but it is completely intradural. Like this tumor, trigeminal neuronoma is going in the posterior fossa like this, but it is completely intradural. So for the first time in the literature, I removed this tumor without craniotomy. And first time in the literature, I removed this tumor without laminectomy. C2 ganglion is located outside the spinal canal, as I showed you. Open the dura, work within the, this outside the spinal canal, open the dura, work within the dura, and you can, there is no need for any bone work. So this tumor, you should not do any laminectomy or any vertebral artery exposure or anything. Just open the dura, respect mother dura, and you can remove this tumor in very quick time. Like I said, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, this trigeminal neuronoma should not be done more than half an hour or one hour. If you are doing more than, if you are doing five hour operation or 10 hour operation, you are not doing it correctly. You are not respecting the dura. You have to understand that these tumors are quite beautifully resected. Now I want to go to another tumor of skull base chordomas. Chordomas are tumors that arise from the bone. Bones are the softest part of the human body. These tumors grow big, they enlarge, they enlarge, but they cannot transgress the dura. They remain extradural. It is extremely rare, extremely rare that they will go intradural. They remain extradural, they displace the carotid artery anteriorly, they displace the cavernous sinus superiorly. They never encase the carotid artery. They never encase the cavernous sinus nerves. So they are special tumors. So this fact that the carotid artery is displaced anteriorly was first described by me about 25 years ago in this article, 26 years ago. We said that chordomas and chondrosarcomas displace the soft tissues. They destroy the bone, but they displace the soft tissue. They are extra dural in location. You respect the dura. You, res you respect the dural membrane. You know that the artery is displaced anteriorly. There is no artery here. And you can do a very beautiful resection by middle fossa sub ganglion approach that we described in this article. And lateral exposure, the carotid artery is under your control and the whole anatomy is under your control and you can do beautiful surgical resection. This is the carotid artery and this is the dura and you can understand that this is a clival chordoma and you can do a beautiful resection by working within the dura of this tumor. This is the tumor many people now try to do endoscopic nasal root. Of course, that is a good operation, but to have the carotid under control, to have the sixth nerve under control, to have the cranial nerves under control, transcranial root is a beautiful surgical root. I just want to show briefly this video where a transcranial root has been done. You see how the nerves are under my control, how the carotid artery is, this is carotid artery completely under my control. And most importantly, the sixth nerve is under control. You see, it, you do it from the nose, you don't see any of this anatomy. I am not saying there is no role for transnasal surgery. Of course, there is a role for transnasal surgery, but transcranial surgery is the most beautiful under control surgery. I described the supracerebellar approach for clival chordoma. You will be surprised to hear this. You can, you will be surprised to see this supracerebellar approach. You see here, this tumor is clival chordoma. Of course, lateral approach is the beautiful approach, but sixth nerve, you see to identify sixth nerve early in the operation is not possible because it is displaced by the tumor. 
coming from the nose, this distance becomes very big. So I removed this tumor supracerebellar. And the most important thing is the sixth nerve was under my control very early in the operation. So this is another case of plival cordoma. Transnasal will not be a good route. Lateral may not be a good route. So I did it by a supracerebellar route and I removed this tumor in a very beautiful fashion. Even this tumor, you see this tumor to come from the nose is very possible. I'm not saying it is not possible. I'm not saying middle fossa is not possible, but I removed this tumor from a supracerebellar route. Uh, most important is identifying and separating and isolation of both the six nerves was possible early in the operation. So this is an alternative approach. Most important is that dura is intact. Most important is that the mother dura is intact. Cranial nerves are displaced. Carotid artery is displaced. Sixth nerve is displaced. If you have this concept, you can remove these tumors easily. Not easily, but confidently and nicely. If you do not have this concept, you cannot remove these tumors. These are nasopharyngeal tumors. You see the dura is intact. In this, dura is not intact. Nasopharyngeal angiofibromas can be difficult tumors. They can be vascular tumors. They can be, you know, you know they are not only extracranial, extradural tumors. So you have to know that these tumors are difficult and vascular tumors. So in the year 1992, I described transcranial route for these tumors. But to, if I understand that the dura is intact, so this was my approach, which I described in 1994, transcranial route. But now I don't do transcranial route because I know that the dura is intact, cranial, there is a thin shell of bone is intact. I like to do mid facial degloving approach for large tumors. And for smallish tumors, endoscopic or endonasal approach is also useful. But transcranial route is not necessary. Although I described it, I don't use it now. So there can be other tumors like epidermoid tumors, which are dermal tumors, which are from the born from the dura. And they are also respecting of infections are one dangerous thing which has happened more recently, mucormycosis following COVID infections are very common. We have got in my own hospital at this point of time, more than 100 cases of mucormycosis following COVID infection in my own hospital. Many of these things involve the cavernous sinus. So this can be tuberculoma can be involved. Now, briefly, I would like to talk on meningioma, which is our mother tumor. And all neurosurgeons, young or old, learn neurosurgery from operating on meningiomas. Meningiomas are our life. How to operate on cavernous sinus meningioma is a very important thing. So this tumor is a convexity meningioma. It is benign tumor, we know it. But when this tumor goes in the superior cerebral sinus, they become inherently aggressive in nature. When it involves the superior cerebral sinus, they are more aggressive in their behavior. When it goes extracranial or paranasal sinuses, they are almost like malignancies. We know it. And when they are primarily in the paranasal sinuses, they are malignant meningiomas. Similarly, similar with the similar concept, when the tumor involves the cavernous sinus, they are inherently aggressive. When they are primarily in the cavernous sinus, they are more aggressive in nature. When the tumor is on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, they are benign. When they involve outside the cavernous sinus, inside the cavernous sinus, they are more aggressive in nature inherently. And when they go into the sphenoid sinus, they become almost like malignant tumors. So this was intracavernous meningioma. I operated in 1995 and there was a recurrence. So my firm belief is even if you do a radical resection of intracavernous sinus, which are purely intracavernous sinus, the recurrence rates are much higher. This is another tumor I had operated and which is intracavernous sinus tumor, which is very vascular tumor, as you can see, but it was resected. When they go into the paranasal sinuses, they are more 
they are almost like malignancy. So this tumor, you see lateral wall of cavernous sinus arising. There is a vascularity from here. They are benign tumors. Arising from the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus, you, de you devascularize and you remove this tumor. These are relatively benign tumors. They are benign cavernous sinus tumor. You see this arising from the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus, this vascularity, and this has been removed beautifully and long term no recurrence. So this is another tumor arising from the lateral wall. They are more benign tumors. Early in my surgical experience, 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I was much more aggressive in my exposure my, you see this, you can see facial nerve. I describe mobilization of the facial nerve. I describe extensive pitrosectomies and all those things for pitroclival meningiomas. So I, in 2004, I described supracerebellar approach for the first time for these clival, pitroclival meningiomas. Now, many of you know that this approach of mine, supracerebellar approach, posterior cranial fossa approach, which Sami described for the he described retrosigmoid approach like for acoustic tumor, but this is supracerebellar approach, which is a little different from Sami's approach <clears throat> for such pitroclival meningioma. It's a beautiful approach, and many people in the world are doing this approach now. So these kind of tumors can be removed, and some tumor has been left behind in the cavernous sinus, and I have got a very huge series of such tumors being removed by supracerebellar root this tumor also, you know, even in the cavernous sinus, you can remove when it is going in the Meckel's cave. So there are many, many tumors. You see, this is the tumor and this is after you see the fifth nerve, you can follow inside the cavernous sinus. And this is another tumor. You see both vertebral arteries are encased by the tumor by supracerebellar root. I remove this tumor. Just I want to show you the terminal part of this operation. Of course, I cannot show you the whole operation, but you see this tumor by retrosigmoid supracerebellar root. The whole tumor has been removed beautifully and completely. And if you are able to remove these tumors completely, you give a new life to this patient. There is a small residue here, which was missed actually, not left behind. And these tumors can be removed supracerebellar. You see the same tumor. And you see the just few glimpses of the tumor resection by supracerebellar. So I do middle fossa approach for some select tumors, of course, radical pitrosectomy for some select tumors, of course, but for many tumors of this kind, I can now remove. What we have to learn is the art of breaking the tumor, art of demolishing the tumor, art of right. cutting into the tumor and you can do beautiful resections. This is another tumor which was done by supracerebellar root. And you see how, what anatomy you can see, beautiful anatomy. Of course, the video quality is not Ray good here, but what I want to show is not the quality of the video, not the quality of the surgery, not the quality of the technique, but the quality of exposure that you can get after this kind of surgery. This is another tumor, let us see. You see, this is supracerebral. You can see the basilar artery, vertebral artery bifurcation through a supracerebellar root, and you can do a beautiful resection. And what is important in neurosurgery is, of course, the exposure is important. Of course, the dissection technique is important. Your experience in handling the tumor is very critical. The quality of the tumor itself is very critical. And of course, you have to do and you have to go on doing and doing all your life these kind of tumors. Tuberculum cell meningioma is also, I described 70 <laughs> cases in 2002. My experience is more than 300 cases, which is also largest in the world in tuberculum cell meningioma. This is my personal series of 129 cases of olfactory group meningioma, which is also largest in the world. Anterior clinoid meningioma, I gave a definite, I gave a classification in 2000, which is also a huge series of anterior clinoid meningioma. I described for foramen magnum meningioma, we know about extreme lateral approach and all these kind of ex exposures. I described conventional posterior cranial fossa midline exposure 
for these kind of tumors. Now I have got a very huge series where I have done just this kind of exposure, a little bit suboccipital craniectomy, C1 laminectomy, exposure of the vertebral artery early in the operation and working within the nerves, break into the tumor, break into the tumor, and you can do a beautiful resection. I even removed ossified foramen magnum meningiomas by, you see this tumor? It is completely bone, completely bone, and it is encasing the vertebral artery. And this tumor was completely removed. I have a follow-up of more than 15 years on this, on this particular patient. This is another tumor. You see, both vertebral arteries are encased in completely ossified tumor. Within the tumor is the vertebral artery, and this tumor was removed. And I have got very long follow-up of even this case. This is another tumor for Amman Magnum. You see completely ossified. You can imagine located anterior to the brainstem, having complete dark ossification and this tumor within the cranial nerve and this tumor has been removed completely and beautifully. What is important is learn the art of handling the tumor and breaking the tumor and you can, you can avoid very extensive exposure for such tumors which can be removed. So in meningiomas, curing is not, you don't have to remove the meningioma. You have to save the function of the, you, curing is you once a meningioma, always a meningioma. Recurrence of meningioma, you, you see this beautiful sentence, recurrence of meningioma is independent of the extent of tumor resection. It is not the treatment, but the cellular behavior that decides the clinical outcome. So thank you, my dear friends. I hope you have enjoyed my lecture. I hope I was able to give you some nice little small tricks. George, Byron, I hope you are happy with what I have talked about. Thank you very much. And it has been my pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, Professor Atul. I mean, that's a masterclass uh, lecture. Uh, we are proud to say that your experience has no equal, you know? Uh, your technique, your knowledge, uh, all the knowledge about the dura, or you, uh, all the time that, that you have been working with these uh, kind of patients, uh, I guess they are pretty lucky that uh, you could save their lives. And we are lucky because we are uh, learning so much from you, from all your experience. And uh, we really appreciate for all your experience in the field. Uh, I much. guess we Thank can you. now... We can now start with some uh, comments from the panelists. Uh, we have here Professor Loyo, Professor Kohn, Professor Amador, Professor okay. Fakini. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any, any comments. Dr. Loyo, please go ahead. No, no, you have you to unmute. unmute. Dr. Loyo. Dr. Okay. Dr. Gold. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I have the song now. Yes. Dr. Gold, the two questions. You never use the combined supra and infracellular approach for the treatment of the large hypophysial tumor. I published this uh, approach many years ago. Uh, you never is, is in. 1985, you never use this approach? No, I have this never one, actually- One of the questions. Yeah, I have never actually combined. I have never combined transcranial and transnasal root. I have never combined. Sometimes what happens is- I never come in the same time. Never combined. Because sometimes I, if I'm not able to remove from the nose, I may go transcranial at a later date, not at the same stage. So that is my strategy. Okay, the another approach is the uh, sublabial and plate approach for the cavernosenos for the school base. Because now you, you know, the more of the people use the uh, extra dural school base in cordoman, in pituitary, and it's possible, I describe this, uh, this approach in the book of the Bincondolen, 
uh, about the sublabial ampliate uh, approach university? No, no, I do sublabial, I use, like Jules Hardy's approach, I use. We also use endoscope for removal sometimes. But what yes, my, the endoscope now is better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what my presentation is basically talking about the philosophy, about the dual relationship, about when to go from the nose, when to go and from the nose. What did you experience? What do you say about this approach? Of course, transnasal approach is very important for chordomas, very good approach for selected cases. But I have also to say that transcranial rot is also very important for selected cases. And transnasal approach can be used for P2T tumors, but never for cavernous hemangiomas, which I showed. If you use cavernous hemangioma transnasal approach, you will, you can damage the person. I described, I said that nasopharyngeal angiofibromas, you use transnasal approach. I used to do transcranial route. I don't use transcranial route. So we have to learn and we are, as you know, you know, from our experience, we have to go on improving and learning and developing our own approaches. You know, you, you know this approach, you read the, the book of the Vin Condolen about the school-based surgery. Yeah, yeah, Vin Condolen is of course my personal friend and a personal friend for a very long time. And uh, we know about his work on cavernous sinus. And we know, we have learned so much from Vinko Dolans. I know him very well, personally. He's my very yes, good he's friend. he's a very good friend, Mike, that he invited to me and he write this, uh, this paper. Uh, thank you very much. And do you think your opinion is good in, in any special case? I what is the special what... case? What do you, in your opinion? No, I, I When do you understand. use this approach? For P2T tumors, translab sublabial approach. Which approach? Yes, in your opinion, what is the best use for this approach in this tumor, in cordoman, in pituitary tumors, with the coming to the school base, yeah, and okay. you need the open the cavernous senos for the uh, for the frontal approach um, you look and you not touch the nervous and you you escalate the carotid artery in the in the base and in the intracranial and it's very very clear the situation of the tumor and it's very easy to remove this tumor now with the endoscope in the last time in 85, which is I, I described this, this approach is not endoscope. I use the microscope with the big window and it's possible looking very clear all the structure of the school base around the cavernosenos. Yes, of course, of course. I agree with you completely. I completely agree with you. For P2T tumors, for chordomas, endoscopic work and transnasal route is a very good operation. I agree with you. And for even when the tumor goes in the I, cavernous sinus, I like to do transnasal route, not, but if cavernous hemangioma, transcranial route, selected chordomas, transcranial route, trigeminal neurinoma, transcranial route. Yes. So for each tumor, different route. That is my strategy. Yes, the, this route is the better because you remove the the external uh, wall of the of, of the maxillar senus, and you had a big hole really, and looking very clear all the structure of the school base. That is my idea when I describe this approach. And the last uh, question is: uh, I will let you trade the remote in the big uh, tumor or the pituitary tumors with the, in the same time, use the, the remove the supracellar and the infracellar. You present the very nice uh, uh, drive, drive in the, you put the, the woman 
with the same with the one uh, uh, boy he is born. <laughs> um, yeah. It's the same because you push to the intracranial and you receive in the sphenoidal, in the sphenoidal for the transnasal or sublabial approach all the tumor and it's a big descompression and it's very easy coming to the intracavernous senus with you move, you, you remove completely the tumor and very easy really because you you only push the tumor in the supra in the intracranial and receive in the transnasal cranial all the tumor. It's a very easy and I present the second uh, the, the second uh, the papers in our chief of the world uh, about the what is the the indication of this approach the years and the condition of the pacing and the Karnowski. Um, I think so I would like the, because you had a very good experience you had a very number of case is the same the, with the Mexico with you big 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 tumor because the people coming late to the to the doctors. Yeah. I would like you try it. I invite to you try the try this this uh, this approach. Okay. <laughs> and thank you very much. It's a fantastic presentation. Congratulations, doctor. It's thank a you. pleasure listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, Dr. Loyo. Uh, we have here Juan Luis Gomez Amador, uh, experienced school-based surgeon. And regarding that, we are discussing the use of the endoscope. Uh, I would like to ask him, what are the advantages and limitations of endoscopy to the cavernous sinus? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Salazar. Definitively, uh, it's not a surprise. We are, all, we are all gladly impressed by this enlightening and comprehensive lecture, not just about the cavernous sinus, but the, the entire skull base. Uh, I like a lot the, the embryological anatomical concept of Professor Goel uh, concerning uh, how to deal with the tumors, preserving the different structures that, that cover the tumor. And he also showed us a very important thing that that is uh, the, the concepts of Professor Yashargil. Precise understanding of uh, anatomy, uh, a very acute tridimensional sense, but also he, he showed us the courage to perform the different surgical maneuvers with a common sense. So. If the tumor is covered by the dura, don't touch the dura. So this is a very uh, important uh, matter concerning uh, the, the treatment of these uh, skull-based tumors. Now, uh, I know Professor Atuguel knows the development of endoscopic endonasal surgery for skull-based uh, lesions. And I know there, are, that there have been some abuse in the indications of endoscopic endonasal approaches. And he showed us different corridors in which uh, we can go and treat lesions in the subarachnoid space or in, in the, the interdural approaches. And uh, I, I think as he showed, uh, as he mentioned before, endoscopic uh, techniques are useful for the treatment of certain pathologies in the skull base. Uh, concerning uh, specifically what you asked about the pituitary tumors, I, I believe that the pituitary tumors, when you come uh, by the nose, it's very easy in most of the cases to take out the tumor that is embedded in the cavernous sinus because this is a very soft tumor. And as Professor uh, Goel said, uh, uh, it takes 25 to 45 minutes to take out the tumor. If you are uh, using more time, perhaps you are not doing a proper strategy to demolish the tumor. This is a very interesting concept to learn how to demolish the tumor to take out the tumor in a proper fashion, but uh, using this common sense, right? So this is a, a very appreciable thing, uh, Professor Goel. I, I think one of the most important things that you have shown us is that the pathology in, in, in your country is very similar, as Professor Loyo said before, in, in that, the, that we are looking in our country and, and even in, in the whole Latin American area. Uh, so we, we need to take advantage of your ex expertise. And uh, the, the most important concept is this 
this, this embryological and anatomical combination and the precise concept of to learn how to demolish the tumor. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your comments, uh, Professor Amado. I think we had a slowdown in uh, a tool. Yeah, I guess he's not. He's, he's like, just hang in there. He, he, he always comes out. It's siempre regresa. <laughs> Go ahead, Atul. Yeah, yeah. See the, uh, are you able to hear? John? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. So basically what I have to, uh, what I will like to do is, my next presentation, I will like to talk on craniovertebral junction and spine. And yeah, I want perfect. to give, and I want to give you some concepts on craniovertebral junction and spine. And then, as I mentioned to you, I will like to talk on arteriovenous malformation. So let us organize this, Baron, and make it a beautiful yeah, series. And so next will be yeah, craniovertebral course. junction. And I want to introduce to the Latin America. I think Latin Americans are not very familiar with craniovertebral junction treatment. This is my impression. I am not sure. So I want to give you a very elaborate discussion on the craniovertebral junction problems and treatment. And then I will yeah, sure, Professor. and then I will introduce you to some additional facets about instability of craniovertebral junction and spinal instability. So I hope I can uh, uh, give you some new information in my subsequent lectures. Okay, Byron? Yes, for sure, Professor. We will be delighted to organize your seminars uh, and we will be sending you the specifics, the date and time, but I guess it's a, it's a nice way to, to learn from you. Thank you very much, thank you. So, uh, John, uh, Byron, uh, John, I guess, uh, I guess my dad's speaking, but I, I, I think he's muted somehow, that it's not um, reproducing sounds. Can I have some comments from George? Go ahead. Jo yeah, he was speaking, but I, uh, uh, I, I guess there is something wrong with the, with the, with the Zoom that uh, his voice doesn't sound. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Professor, uh, Professor Atul. Uh, I have yeah. lots of questions here that uh, are regarding the demolishing of the tumor. <laughs> you have spoken a lot of how to learn to demolish. And one of the most uh, questions that many of, uh, of the residents specifically have is what instruments do you use? What are your settings? And what is your, your way, actually, the, the technical issue to learn to, to demolish those tumors? See, demolition can be learned only by, you know, you know, more the experience you get, more and more tumors you get, more and more you love your subject, more and more you are in the operation theater, more tumors. You can hear, uh, Byron, you, you're hearing? Yes, yes, Professor, yes. So more you operate, more you do, more you are in the, you should love to operate, you should love the smell of the operation theater you should be always in the operation theater. If you do that, you will, your technique will improve. Your quality will improve. You have to, you see what you have to do is debulk the tumor, break the tumor, respect mm -hmm. the membranes, respect the blood vessels, respect the perforators, respect the cranial nerves. Tease the tumor of these tumor, uh, tissues. You see, nobody can, you know, you have to just do it. And you have to have that will. And you have to have that confidence. You see, many of my tumors are very vascular tumors. I will show you one. I will give you one presentation of AVMs, arteriovenous malformation surgery. You can imagine arteriovenous malformation means bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. You have to know how to operate in bleeding situations. And if there is bleeding, you don't have to keep on burning, coagulating, coagulating, coagulating. If you go on coagulating, you will never finish the operation. So that is a very important, like in acoustic tumor. In acoustic tumor, you need to coagulate very little. 
if you go on coagulating on, 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 if you go on coagulating, you will never be able to finish acoustic tumor surgery. So it is very important to understand that you have to learn to operate in a bleeding territory. And you have to know which vessel has to be coagulated, which vessel has to be avoided. So these things have to be learned. George. Do you maybe use the, the CUSA for your surgery? Yeah, of course, it can be used. We, but unfortunately, I don't like that CUSA instrument. I use my suction I, and I have a controlled suction where I can move the thumb and break the tumor. And very rarely I use CUSA. CUSA is a good tool and I don't discourage people using CUSA. But I, if you ask me personally, I don't like CUSA very much. Sometimes, rarely I use it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. George? Professor Atul, um, <laughs> your experience is so great and many neurosurgeons from overall the world cannot do the things that you do. So there is a learning curve that has to be learned step by step. Perhaps you can summarize some of the first steps beyond learning the anatomy, doing a right diagnosis before a, a surgery, and also uh, dissection techniques to avoid the injury to the nerves and the arteries. I will invite you all to visit me in India, and it will be my pleasure to host you. I conduct very often uh, workshops in my department, we conduct at least three or four workshops every year. And those are very heavily attended workshops. And uh, I wish that people from Latin America can come and spend some time with me. And I will, it will be my pleasure to host you and your uh, younger colleagues. As regards the technique, you see technique is uh, every Surgeon has his own technique. Most important thing is we have to learn the art of controlling bleeding. We have to learn the art of respecting bleeding. We have to handle blood loss throughout our life. We have to learn how to handle the anatomy, respect the membranes, respect the dura, respect the arachnoid matter respect the perforators, respect the you know, So many things, George, as you know, neurosurgery is a huge subject. We have to, basically, we have to enjoy it. Basically, we have to just live neurosurgery. And if we live and learn, love to live neurosurgery, we can do whatever we want. And that is what I have done in my life. Juan Lewis, did Thank you have you, a Professor. question? Did you have a question, Juan Lewis, or comment? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Goyle, uh, when we are teaching the residents in the OR, uh, what do you think is the role of uh, use uh, the Doppler navigation and all these uh, tools to increase the safety of the surgical procedure and also to, to get familiar the resident with the anatomy that we are facing in the, in the, in the, in the patient? And a second question, uh, what do you think about the use of uh, multi-layer reconstruction techniques for those big uh, uh, spaces that we are living after taking out the huge tumor. Okay, so, you know, I will answer the second question about multi-layer reconstruction and vascularized pedicle reconstruction. One is uh, reconstruction using free flaps, free grafts like fat and muscle and all. Second thing is vascularized pedicle reconstruction using a pericranial layer, temporalis muscle and facial layers. So you must read several articles of mine on reconstruction. I have, uh, I, I'm sure you must have read my vascularized bone flap reconstruction, osteomyoplastic flap, subgallial fascia flap reconstruction. I have described at least 20 flaps for reconstruction, including multi-layer uh, transcranial reconstruction, multi-layer middle fossa reconstruction, so these are very important. As you know, reconstruction is the most important thing. You do a good operation. If you don't do reconstruction, you will have a failure. As regards the use of uh, uh, technology, 
you see technology is very important technology but philosophy is the most important you have to know the art of the subject technology will help but philosophy will take you to the point you need navigation of course you need navigation but you cannot be dependent on navigation you have to be dependent on your vision you have to dependent on your anatomy you have to dependent on your experience and you have to dependent on you how you if you go on using you see i have seen people doing glioma surgery continuous you see the uh, intraoperative mri this that the operation will go on for 20 hours you see if you go on doing like that you should take the help of technology but you cannot be a prisoner of technology you understand what i'm saying you, you i'm not saying don't use technology but if you are you, you cannot do the operation without the technology then it is not correct you should be able to do the operation even if there is no technology technology can help you but technology cannot victimize you i think navigation ultrasound should be used but they should not be you should not spend hours and hours on using this kind of things we use technology we use navigation but i will also tell you during my experience of so many years in skull based surgery my exposures have become less and less and less as i mentioned i used to do extensive pterosectomy i used to mobilize the facial nerve carotid artery all the time but over the period my exposure has reduced similarly my dependence on technology has remarkably reduced like navigation i use it is always in my theater but i use it very rarely because i don't think it is absolute indicator of using technology all the time so i think it is good tool for teaching in residents and teaching young students but they have to be taught very important lessons in anatomy and when you open the brain you have to teach them that where exactly is the motor strip where exactly is this sulcus where exactly is this sulcus where are the white fibers where is the ifa where is the uncinate fibers where are the um, um, arcuate fibers rather than having dependence on of course glioma surgery i will give a lecture if byron asks me on glioma i want to give a lecture on my strategy of glioma also i will give i hope i in a subsequent so i will i will have a series with you with multiple lectures and over the series i will give you my surgical strategy on various subjects so byron so be prepared for a long series and a long winter with you okay perfect sir we will be waiting for you, waiting for you. Uh, one one uh, question that uh, is um, a compliment from dr uh, amador's question about the monitoring of intracranial uh, intracranial nerves uh, during surgery uh, you know you, you think you said that you use or you don't like to use um, a lot of technology so what would be the key points to find the nerves in the current sense because we all know that they're going to be displaced and some of them will be covered so what's your strategy to find them See, it is very important question for those who are doing cavernous sinus surgery. This is a very critical question, and uh, you have to know that the nerves enter and nerve exit. These points remain stable, like sixth nerve enters in the dura. That point remains constant. You see, so if you have to identify the nerve, you have to identify the entry point from where it is entering into the cavernous sinus. So if you have to identify the third nerve, you have to identify from its entry point. So this is a very important question. Basically, these things are, very, you know, when you are doing intracavernous sinus surgery, like cavernous hemangioma, that time you don't need to identify third nerve, fourth nerve, fifth nerve, because they are outside in the dura. So it is very important to know what tumor you are operating. And in that situation, you have to identify the sixth nerve. And you have to identify how the sixth nerve is displaced by the tumor on the lower aspect, on the inferior aspect, along the floor of the cavernous sinus. So that is important to know where the nerve will be displaced. Like chordomas, can you answer this question? Where is the sixth nerve displaced in chordomas, Byron? Can you let me? Can we tell me where the sixth nerve is, is displaced in chordomas? It is a difficult question. Nobody can answer this question. Nobody. 
has ever written on this. So if you read my paper on supracerebellar approach to clival chordomas, I have mentioned that the sixth nerve is dis carotid artery is displaced anteriorly and the sixth nerve is displaced superiorly. So the distance between carotid artery and the sixth nerve becomes increased in a clival chordoma. So this relationship is so important. Basically every tumor you have to do in a different manner. Meningiomas are one issue where you have to identify the nerve in the tumor and that it can be a little bit dangerous and difficult. Thank you so much, sir, for your answer. We have a question from Dr. Luis Sulka. Dr. Sulka, go ahead. Do you have a question? Go ahead, Dr. Sulka. I guess not. I would like to, to make questions to Dr. Abhi Shah, since she is a master in anatomy. So, this is a basic tool that every neurosurgeon should uh, dominate. So I would like her to can give us some pointers on, in relation to the, the, the structure, the anatomical structure of the cavernous sinus. Please, Dr. Abdiyasha, can you unmute yourself? Thank yes, you. Professor George. I, I didn't hear part of your question. What did you say? Anatomy of, anatomy, anatomy of cavernous sinus. Anatomy of cavernous sinus. What is the protocol to learn how to you train the main pointers about the anatomy? So anatomy of the cavernous sinus, you have to understand how the nerves are displaced and how they run in the dura, basically. You start with learning of the dura with the extradural approach as Professor Goel has described. And once you start, when you go on your cadaveric dissection and you start peeling off the dura, then you start identifying the nerves on the floor of the middle fossa one by one. And you see their relation with each other and the triangles that they make. And then once you identify the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, then you go on the roof of the cavernous sinus to identify which nerves are present on the roof then which nerves are present on the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. This is one aspect of the cavernous sinus. And the other one is the carotid artery. Basically, how the nerves are in relation to the carotid artery is another important point that you have to understand when you're doing the dissection. And you will get this three-dimensional perspective only once you do the dissection yourself. By just seeing on the photographs or something, you will not get that appreciation. So it is always better to do a cadaveric dissection and then of course see many operative videos to get that understanding. Thank you, Professor Afisha. I would like to ask uh, Professor Kugo L. You have said that you have revolutionized the study of cavernous sinus surgery based on the anatomy of the dura mater. This is a very interesting point when when you see a tumor, you can say if it goes beyond the dura mater or not. So how can you differentiate on magnetic resonance image? When do you have to perform a surgical approach from a tumor? Should be intradural, extradural? What is the importance when the tumor displaces or encases the internal carotid artery? See, basically, <clears throat> Every tumor has a discrete relationship with the dura. Every tumor will have a very special relationship with the cranial nerves. Every tumor will have a very special relationship with the carotid artery. So that we have to know which is what tumor, like for instance, chordoma has a different relationship with carotid artery. P2T tumor has a different relationship with carotid artery. Trigeminal neuronomas have a different relationship with carotid artery. So every tumor has a very special relationship with carotid artery and with the cranial nerves. And we have to visualize the tumor <clears throat> on the basis of what tumor we are going to operate. We have to understand what is the tumor on the basis of clinical findings, on the basis of radiological findings, 
on the basis of MRI findings and various and your own personal experience. So George, these are matter of individual tumors that we have to understand. When the tumor is encasing the carotid artery, that is a different tumor. Like if it is a meningioma, you have to organize that tumor surgery in a different fashion. Pituitary tumor, carotid artery encasement is a very common phenomenon, but the tumors are very soft, pituitary tumors, meningiomas are firm tumors where the dissection can become difficult. So it will depend on the vascularity of the tumor, consistency of the tumor, nature of the tumor, and on various other factors as to how you dissect in each individual situation. As far as the dural relationship of the pituitary tumor is concerned, I'm sure you must have enjoyed this uh, discussion which I made, but this was not there, this information was not there 20, 25 years ago. Even the trigeminal neuronoma, which I showed the interdural relationship, this nobody knew 25 years ago, nobody knew how to operate trigeminal neuronoma during those times. And as I mentioned, everybody used to operate in two stages and preserving of the fish, uh, trigeminal function. Nobody was talking about trigeminal function preservation in uh, trigeminal neuronomas. So these are very important issues and transcranial surgery was so common for pituitary tumor, like everybody used to do transcranial surgery for pituitary tumor 30 years ago. So what we have done is, I have no doubt about it, that these kind of understanding about dura and all those things have helped completely understand these problems and the surgery has become much simpler, particularly in my own experience. Thank you, sir, for your... Uh, I would finally like to, to comment something and, you know, get the thoughts of the more experienced ones about cavernous sentence meningiomas. It's a controversy theme. You know, we have a lot of man management options. Uh, uh, we can observe it. We can do some microsurgery. We, or sometimes they can have a radiation treatment. Or in some places like in Europe, uh, even an immunotherapy like checkpoint inhibitors. And we know that uh, observation for those tumors uh, basically are because our benign lesions, they, are, they show slow growth rates. Uh, usually they are small, they are not life threatening. So maybe as uh, one said, we all do not have your skills. And maybe a surgery involving that area would end in an unfavorable results following surgery. And we have to know, of course, the natural history of cavernous sense meningiomas. And some papers in the literature uh, say that uh, they might not even change in 75% of cases or their growth will be so slow. Uh, so the, the goals of microsurgery would eventually be the cure of the disease. And that's one point of discussion. The relief of symptoms and of course the histopathological analysis. Uh, and we know that the degree of resection of many humans uh, will depend on the degree of internal carotid involvement. And maybe subtotal resection would be in some cases an effective strategy. And regarding that, uh, Radio surgery treatment should be reserved maybe for some remnants with secondary growth and some clinical manifestations. And that being said, and my question for you, Professor Goel and all the panelists, what would be your philosophy of treatment for these many germs in the current okay. sense? Okay, Byron. So this is a very interesting question. So what I will like to do is I will like to share my screen. Okay, just a minute. And you see the screen. Sure. Not yet. Now you can see the screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you read this beautiful line. You see, I, I mentioned, I showed in my presentation that cavernous sinus meningiomas, which enter into cavernous sinus, are inherently more aggressive. I mentioned this and cavernous meningiomas which go into the sinuses are more aggressive. They are like malignancies. So we should never, you see, curing, we should never operate. We should see to it that we preserve the function. Like if the third nerve is 
going to be damaged by your dissection, don't, don't do that dissection. If you are going to damage a perforator, you, you have to leave that perforator. So don't go for a cure. You have to have a symptomatic. The patient should recover. If you have to leave some tumor behind, you leave it. But you don't try to be curing the person. Another beautiful sentence I am giving you, and this is particularly true for cavernous sinus meningioma. You, leave, you know, we talk about Simpson grading, we talk of uh, removal of the dura, we talk of removal of the bone, and we talk of this and that. But in general, my philosophy is this. My, my philosophy is that recurrence of a meningioma is independent of the extent of tumor resection. So this is a very controversial statement which I had made, but this is a very important statement that you do the surgery within the safety limits as much as you can. You cannot do, don't overdo it. So in cavernous sinus particularly, this is very important. You do radical resection. You do very radical resection, but don't try to, you know, don't try to cure the person because recurrence is not in your hand. That is the second thing. You see, this is the beautiful statement that I am keeping for you. It's not the treatment, it is not the extent of resection, but the cellular behavior of the tumor that will decide the recurrence. So these are some statements regarding meningiomas. Other thing is the need for radiation treatment. You see, if you leave some tumor behind, you give radiation. I don't like that kind of philosophy. I don't like, I don't do, I don't give, unless, if the tumor recurs, I like to reoperate. I will give radiation only when I think that I cannot reoperate. I am not able to operate. So when my knife is not able to handle, then I use gamma knife. Surgical knife first, gamma knife last. That is my philosophy. Byron. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have a question from Omar Hamoud. Please, Omar, okay. ask your question. Thank you, Dr. George. Thank you, Dr. John, Dr. John, Professor. Thank you. Good presentation. I yeah. asked Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Atul uh, from the past uh, 30 years ago for you. The first idea of what first uh, time you notice that about the two breaths, uh, preservation, the neuronoma for about regime and nerve. What's your idea at that time you, you find? What you notice at that time? When you think to see basically, you know what my advantage was that I work in a factory. You see, in a factory of patients. You see, we are operating so much, and that is my advantage. I have got several disadvantages in my country. India is not a rich country or it is not America, it is a poor country. But we have advantages like number of people, number of patients. We operate free of cost. There is no money charged when I operate on my patients here. So because there is no money, there are so many people, we are operating 17 cases, 15 cases. You see, like that on a regular basis, 10 cases on a routine, we do 10 neurosurgical major cases in a day. So that is the advantage that we are having. Sometimes I personally operate 10 cases. Sometimes I have operated 13 cases in one day personally. So that advantage, I use that advantage. I have used that advantage over several years. And that has given me a solid, you see, nobody can argue with me because of my power of my patients. But if you ask me, uh, you know how much money I have made. I am. I am. A, I am not a rich man. You see, because I don't get so much paid. I am a working as a pro full professor. So that is the disadvantage. But I use my advantage. Neurosurgery volume is my is my advantage. The number of people that I operate is my advantage, and the quality of my residents and quality of my associates is my advantage. I have got top level people working with me, so that is my advantage. So I use my advantage. And that is what I have done in my life of neurosurgery. Thank you, Professor. And I guess that's one of those things that actually 
for example, Ecuador doesn't have. We all have like 30 million people total in the whole country. And uh, of course, we can have the numbers that you have. And that is why like some uh, other countries from South America or maybe in a small place in Europe have used, for example, that radio surgery for, for many geomas in the cavernous islands because of their effective um, controlling the disease 95% over five years, uh, maybe 90% over 10 years uh, compared with surgery alone. So wh what we are seeing in some cases is that you know they make a surgery, of course, not your kind of surgery, but the remains are actually still big. And of course, they send it to radio surgery and hope to keep the, the disease control. Or in some cases, well, when they are small, they tend to irradiate first. And the question will be, uh, we know that the, their growth will be slow. So how can you tell that actually the tumor is growing? Because we know that when some uh, center makes the MRI, they can have some different operator do the, the, um, the, the size of the tumor and it will give one, maybe two millimeters in difference. And maybe that's not even a uh, true growth. So what would be your experience to tell us to, to know, to, to be sure that the, these tumors are growing in time? The best thing is don't give radiation to benign tumors. You give them, you operate and remove them. And when you, and you do a safe operation, you do a very, if, you, if necessary, do a conservative operation, like for acoustic tumor. <clears throat> like for acoustic tumors is a beautiful neurosurgical, uh, neurosurgical material. My feeling is that all our young people should learn how to operate on acoustic tumor. But if you give facial nerve palsy in 100% of patients, then the patient should go for gamma knife. If you are giving him palsy of the facial nerve all the time you operate and there is a full palsy, then you, the patients will be happier with gamma knife because at least there will be no palsy. So you have to learn how to operate and you have to teach young people how to operate and you have to teach how to save the facial nerve and you have to teach how, in large tumors how to stop, when to stop, when not to dissect, when not to tease the facial nerve, where not to touch the facial nerve. I will give you my philosophy of facial nerve large tumors. My philosophy of large facial nerve tumor is very clear that in large facial nerve tumors, which are more than four centimeters in size, you have to always leave a shell of tumor on the facial nerve. If you say I can remove the whole tumor without leaving a shell of tumor, I don't believe you. I've got so much experience in acoustic tumor surgery that if you try to tease the facial nerve from the capsule, you will certainly damage it. So you leave a small shell of the tumor. That is my philosophy. Even in large acoustic tumors, you can do a beautiful operation. The problem comes in very small tumors, very one centimeter or 1.5 centimeter. In that, the problem comes, whether you want to operate or whether you want to give gamma knife. So those tumors are a little bit controversial. I, in my hospital, in some cases, we do give radiation, but in general, if it is a situation of one centimeter, maybe I just observe him for several months, several years. And if it grows, then we operate basically to, Gamma knife and radiation should not, I don't personally like it. I don't personally give it. I don't want to recommend it. I want young and senior neurosurgeons to operate beautifully. I want them to learn to save the nerves. I don't want them to give, radiate and finish. Then where will be our neurosurgeons become neurosurgeons? When they will become technically profound. But also we must remember, we cannot learn by doing wrong things on the patient. We cannot make 10 facial palsy and then say, okay, I have learned on 10 patients. You cannot do like that. Every individually, every human is important. We have, to be, we have to be masters on the first case. We cannot say, okay, young fellow, you operate. You don't worry about the facial nerve. Everybody with facial nerve. But you, you think about the patient. You know, even in my hospital, I was saying my patients are poor. But poor does not mean that they don't like their face. 
you understand some people told me that oh your patients are poor you don't they don't bother about their face completely nonsense even the poor person likes his face even young people like their face old people like their face girls like their face boys like their face face is your identity you cannot say okay operate and facial nerve palsy i am not saying that i don't give facial nerve palsy don't misunderstand me there are several acoustics where i get facial nerve palsy but if you give facial nerve palsy to 100% of patient then you should not be operating acoustic tumors thank you professor thank we you have seen, thank you i've never experienced in a surgeon telling us how to do very complicated surgeries but we have many young neurosurgeons we have residents they are wondering how's the natural step by step how to learn these techniques. So there are certain levels in the learning curve that every resident or surgeon should achieve. For example, uh, on the first level, uh, perhaps you're going to operate a tuberculum cell of angioma or sphenoid meningioma, but you have to do certain specific tasks. For example, how to do the peeling, how to do the anterior clydenectomy. Second, if you have another second level, more complicated, like a lateral paracoidal aneurysm, you have to take out the outer rings or the inner rings so you can approach the, the arteries. So I would like to ask some of the professors here in the chat, they have um, a lot of uh, programs in their postgraduate students. Do they teach that in a very specific manner? For example, I have, I would like to ask Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador and the other uh, assistants, if they teach this in a specific manner? Excuse me, sir, I, I didn't hear properly the question. Yeah, in your postgraduate program, do you have this step-by-step -step learning curve so you can do this specific tasks to approach the governor's science. Yes, sir. We have a laboratory in the microsurgical department, and we try to teach the residents step by step uh, the different parts of the surgical procedure. But as Professor Goel said, uh, it is very important to teach them in the operating room. So they need to learn how to deal with these uh, precise dissections in order to preserve the nerves, the arteries, the veins, and also the brain parenchyma. I think the, there should be a combination of both the cadaveric projection and the, the specific models, and also uh, the teaching in the OR. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so thank much. You so much. I guess we don't have any more questions. I would like to thank a lot Professor Goel for uh, teaching us. Every every time he 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 gives his lecture, we all learn a lot. And I would like to thank Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador, Professor Loyo, uh, Professor Facchini, every one of the participants today for being with us on a Saturday. Uh, we really appreciate it and we will be seeing you in two weeks. I like to thank, of course, Neurosurgical TV and John Bennett for this opportunity. And I guess, and I give you all of you a good day and have a nice weekend. I will, like to talk, I will like to talk next time on craniovertebral junction. And I will like to show my philosophy on Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, and things like this. Okay? Yeah. Of course, Thank Professor. You. We will Thank set that you. up. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. much. That's why they call him the, he's the king of Zoom in neurosurgery. <laughs> That's why they call him that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Bye bye. 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 Bye b